Hello everybody and welcome to another exciting installment of General Biology 1. Today we're going to be talking about populations, how they grow, and how it can shape life history of organisms. This is the walled city in Kowloon and I remember growing up and seeing this city on TV and I was told that this is the most dense uh, grouping of human beings ever to have existed. So how many people do you think live in this uh, in this facility, if we can call it that? It's basically a collection of, of buildings on top of each other, and that aerial view might give you an idea of how large it is relative to those other apartment blocks. Well, it's interesting, because you never get a straight answer from anybody. The place was uh, essentially, uh, you know, poor people live there. They live there in a very... Uh, frankly lawless condition, a lot of organized crime was going on in there, and it was a place that because of its very nature and the fact that you can't simply just drive through it or walk through it, um, it becomes quite a, quite a difficult thing to estimate. But at some point, they say that there might have been as many as 300,000 people living in there, although the real estimates were probably somewhere between 50 and 75,000 people, which is still a lot of people. It's not a very large thing. People living on top of each other, tiny little rooms, uh, and people just built things. There's no facilities. There might, the tendency was for garbage to be taken up on top of the roof instead of being, uh, being let out. And this was eventually demolished, and they have a monument now in a park. So this, this mass of humanity was forced to move, forced to migrate, uh, especially with the, the takeover of Kowloon area with Hong Kong in the 90s, but it was actually destroyed in like the mid-90s. Um, but I remember hearing about it, and I remember watching kung fu movies where a lot of things were set in this place, where this is like the seedy bad area of town. But uh, it's hard to estimate population sometimes, and it really depends on what you want to think uh, in terms of what term are you interested in. So here are some terms. See if you could uh, define these terms. Population, population density, distribution, dispersion. Well, again, it depends, right? A population you have to accurately define. This is a population of sheep because it is a herd of sheep. But it could just as easily be a population of all of the sheep in a country or all of the sheep in the world, right? So any of these things can be defined. You probably are part of many populations. You're part of the population of Rollins. You're part of the population of your city. You're part of the male population of the United States or the female population of the United States, right? So it really depends how you define. Uh, and as a term, it's not particularly useful unless you have a specific reason for employing it. A more interesting measure, however, is when you look at population relative to the area. And so you get a measure of what, what we call population density, right? This place looks very dense with regards to sheep. It's not normally this way, right? They might be dispersed in other ways, right? Which gets to our next term, distribution. When we talk about the distribution of animals, what we're talking about is how are they located across the landscape? More than just the numbers of them in a place, how are they, how are they distributed throughout that population? Are they clumped like this one herd here? Do they move together? Or are they solitary and, and living as far apart from each other as they can, right? which kind of gets into our next thing about dispersion. Dispersion is essentially a measure of how much individuals in that population are able to move around. So you can see it's already gotten really complicated. We're only on the second slide, right? So how do we determine the overall population size of organisms? Obviously, this is a very useful thing. We'll get into the ideas of conservation, knowing what population you're dealing with. And how big it is has enormous implications, right? And in many ways, it's kind of the point of conservation, animal conservation, plant conservation. You want to know what's out there, and you want to try and increase it, right? Or maybe you want to try and suppress it if it's a pest or something, right? So how do we go about doing this? Well, we can't measure everything. That's the first thing, right? So we have to sample from the population knowing that we're not going to get everything. So what can we do? Well, we can sample smaller areas and simply extrapolate. Right? If we know that the population in this small section of forest is a certain amount of, let's say, chipmunks, then maybe we can extrapolate, well, we have, you know, this much area. So if the population is the same as it is in that little small forest fragment, then we can say that there's probably this many chipmunks out there in this larger forest. 
right? Sometimes we're lucky. We can use an index that can give us a good measure of population size. So maybe you can't sample all of the birds in a place, but maybe you can find their nests easily. So something like a colony, right? A penguin colony, for example. You can, you know, when they're not there, you can look at the nests. And for each nest, you can say, oh, there's two birds, right? Something like that. We use that as well, right? How many times do you hear about U.S. households? You know, this many households. It's a very easy way to, to estimate population, right? If you assume a population of four, which they do, um, as being a U.S. household or at least, a, you know, two or whatever, that gives you an indication of, um, you know, what the possible population is in an area, right? You can do that with Google Maps. Now, if you're more interested in getting a more accurate picture of a population, well, you kind of have to go out and, and, you know, find these individuals and, if you can, tag individuals in a population. So we use mark and recapture techniques. So this is a picture uh, actually from my animal conservation class that I run during intercession week uh, in January. And we're banding birds. And that's a Carolina wren that I'm holding and I'm attaching a bird band to its leg. Right. So the idea is that this bird band, this little aluminum band, has a unique number that corresponds to that individual of that species caught at that time. I let it go. A year later or whenever, I might set a net and catch that same individual. And I'll have a record of it. So mark, recapture. Now, I'm not going to catch every Carolina wren, but I tagged a few of those Carolina wrens. And the basic premise is, the greater the proportion of individuals you tagged in a population, the higher the likelihood you're going to catch it a second time, right? Assuming they don't move out. So that's how this works. And we apply a, a formula that's a very simple formula, right? Tagged individuals is lowercase s. And you're trying to estimate the population size, which would be the capital N. But you capture a small population size, a little n. And then you determine the percentage of the individuals that are out there that have been marked. That's your X. So your chances of catching it a second time, the closer you are to sampling the entire population, the higher that number is in likelihood compared to the population size. So the more accurate measure of population, the more of them you sample and you recapture. Right? So that's the mark recapture formula. It's a pretty straightforward formula. I use it all the time. So population size, I'm sure you know, is not a static thing. I'm sure you know all the things that can impact the population, uh, all these factors. There are factors that contribute to a population. They add individuals. Birth uh, obviously adds new individuals. Immigration into an area also adds new individuals. And on the flip side, death and emigration, leaving the area, that all subtracts from population. These processes are going on all of the time. So here's a population of these song sparrows. I used to work on song sparrows, fun fact. Uh, and, they're, and they're being at all times being killed, being born, moving in, moving out, right? So all these factors are at play. So a lot of different factors can influence the size of a population, but they almost always boil down to something like this, right? They could be kind of cut down to these four basic processes. Okay, so the other questions we often have is, why are individuals found where they are? What can account for how individuals in a population are spaced relative to each other? And there's a lot of factors at play. And we can basically boil down to three main distribution patterns or dispersion patterns. The first is a clumped pattern, like you see here with the starfish. There's found in specific areas, right? These starfish have the whole rock they can sit on, but they're hanging out in that one spot. Another, um, so so all the individuals are found throughout throughout a landscape, but in only specific areas do you get numbers of individuals with lots of areas in between with nothing. You could have a situation that's more uniform. So here's a, a colony of king penguins, they're kind of like emperor penguins. Uh, they're the ones found in the sub-Antarctic islands, so just islands off the coast of Antarctica. And you see if you walk among them that they're all kind of evenly spaced within, a, within a, an area, right? And uh, within that colony, that's how they're, that's how they're found. So they're dis distributed pretty equally or uniform. And then you could have seemingly random kind of patterns, if, if that's that's... Kind of an ironic way to say it random patterns um 
Random is by definition no pattern. So an example would be no, the no rhyme or reason of this field with a bunch of dandelion flowers, right? What's accounting for the distribution of these dandelions? So think of some possible factors that can explain these dispersion patterns. I'll give you a second. Okay, if you need more time, you could always pause the video. So uh, usually when I ask this question in my classes, people will say clumped distributions often have to do with some sort of a resource. And that would be an excellent guess, and it would probably be the correct one. So we see clumped distributions usually when there's some sort of resource or some sort of reason to be in the specific areas that they're found. The resource could be food, it could be water, it could be a water hole in a desert, for example. It could be a shaded area in the desert, right? It could be uh, in the mountains, it could be a, an exposed salt lick, right? A lot of animals uh, need to get salt, especially in more arid places, and they'll get this from, from licking minerals directly. So I think about like um, ungulates, like, like deer and antelope and, and, and wild goats and stuff like that. So some sort of, some sort of resource is drawing the bear, right? It could be a stream, it could be anything. Usually when I ask for the uniform one, people will give me some sort of territoriality, and that would be the correct answer. So the reason these penguins are so evenly distributed as they are is because they're all within picking distance of each other. They don't want to have the nests too close to each other. They're always worried about trampling. They're always worried about stealing food from the young. So what they do is they basically stake out a territory. Now, this, in this case, the territory is very small. It's as far as the penguin can reach, basically. So as long as they stay that far apart, you get this uniform distribution around the landscape. But it could be bigger, right? It could be uh, a wolf pack controlling several square miles of forest territory uh, and then keeping other wolves out of that. So each wolf pack will have a certain size territory. So that sort of would, you know, from the air look like a uniform distribution, right, where there's individuals in per particular distances from each other. And then random is usually the one that catches everybody. Usually when we talk about random, it usually means that whatever the means for dispersal of those organisms is going to be a somewhat random thing. So in the case of dandelions, you know that dandelions grow those little those little white fluffy things that, you know, you get the little kid picture where you can like blow on it and it sends those things flying in through the air. Well, the reason they have that is because they disperse through the wind. If you're dispersing through the wind, who knows where you're going to land, right? So once you land, you're just going to germinate wherever you land if the conditions are right. So there's no rhyme or reason. The, you know, once once the, the seeds are taken on the wind, so to speak, it has no control over where it's going to land, right? All they can do is make the best of whatever situation ends up being the case with the with the weeds, right? It's also why they make them very very uh, good weeds because they can disperse so far potentially, right? So even though it's random, it's because the distribution is the result of some kind of random process like the wind. So. When we talk about populations, we're often very interested in demography. And demography is basically the study of populations, and specifically the things that determine population size, population changes. So we already mentioned births and deaths and immigration and emigration. Those are the factors that influence a population. Demography is the study of those factors, right? So this is a, a big benefit to politics, for example, right? We, uh, we can often make predictions about how countries are going to behave based on this. I have more on that later. But it's also important for a conservation biologist. How might that be the case? Well, the key thing, the key thing is prediction. You want to be in a situation where you can make predictions about what's going to happen to a population over time. And that's usually the case, right? You're trying to, to figure out what's going to happen to a population over time. That's a big part of conservation. So demography is very important because understanding those, those vital characteristics, those various rates in a population, will allow you to make predictions that are more accurate. Now, to help you do this, 
often what conservation biologists do is they'll construct what's called a life table. And this is essentially uh, looking at the survival of a population over time and broken down by age, right? So for every age, what are the characteristics of that population and how does it change through time? And the way they do this is usually by taking a cohort uh, and, and a cohort is a, a group of individuals that are the same age, usually from birth, and they'll just follow them through time. And in doing so, they have an understanding of, you know, every age, how that's, how that's, uh, the various conditions are changing. And the goal is to produce a life table. And the life table looks like this. This is the life table for a place in California in the Sierra Nevada mountains. And these are Belding's ground squirrels that have been pretty extensively studied in this place. This Tiago Pass, I think, is just outside of Yosemite uh, National Park. And this is the life table. So you see it's broken down by age, and it's broken into males and females. So what sort of information can you get from this life table, taking a quick look at it? Feel free to pause it if you need more time. Well, I'm guessing the first thing you probably noticed is there's less data for males than there are for females. And there's a very good reason for that. Uh, simply put, males, their lives are just not as long. So you see they start out with about the same number, right? At the beginning of the year in age zero to one, you start out with about, what, 330, 340, 50 uh, animals, right, of both sexes, so females and males. And then you notice males sort of drop off kind of quickly, right? There's this continued sort of the death rate is pretty consistent through time, right? Whereas in females, it's a little bit slower. And the result is that females can live up to 10 years old based on this life table, whereas no males exist uh, past seven years. Right, so six years old is about as old as a male building ground squirrels is going to get in this population, right? And right off the bat, you're looking at this information and you could say, okay, well, it looks like males are sort of more susceptible to whatever the, the environment, whatever's going around the environment. So there must be something about their behavior, there must be something about their, their lifestyle that is making them more exposed to threats from, say, a coyote like that coyote right there that's eating a building ground school, right? It's one of their dominant predators out there, at least now. So you can take this information from a life table and you can use it to generate what's called a survivorship curve. So if you look at the survivorship curve, it's looking at the number of survivors for every year. So right off the bat, you notice, right? The, the number of survivors is more drastic for males, you see a more drastic decline in survival ship in males than you do for females, which is more steady. You also notice females seem to have a pretty steady um, death rate, as, as they call it. Their, their chances of dying are pretty consistent throughout their life, which results in this kind of you know, straightforward decline. Males are pretty similar, at least up until year two, but then all of a sudden, after year two, they start to experience a much more severe decline, right? To where they don't even make it to six years old. So that tells you something. That tells you that something happens at year two that all of a sudden makes males more susceptible to being killed off in this population. Well, it's one of two things. One is it's, uh, that's actually the, the age where they're, they're ready to breed themselves. So they often make themselves more exposed to predators that way. Also, that's uh, during a time of male-male competition for females. So you'll end up having a lot more fights between males. And sometimes those also involve um, them being killed. So you're starting to understand a little bit more about this population based on simply their demographics. And how could this help an endangered species? Well, obviously, it tells you that, okay, um, you know, perhaps males are the, more, the, the ones that need to be better protected Right? If you want to encourage a healthy population, since they seem to be the ones that can decline. So maybe in this particular system, you can remove males after a certain point, take them out of the population, move them somewhere else so they don't get killed, and they can be used to stock up another new population somewhere. 
Who knows, right? The point is it gives you more accurate information on your population, and it could help you, especially if you're dealing with a, a species that's endangered or highly endangered, to the point where you really have to intervene in what happens. So that's a survivorship curve for ground squirrels. For the most part, throughout their life, they experience death rates at roughly the same pace. So they exhibit what we call a type 2 survivorship curve. And there's a ground squirrel again. That's that black line. So in that case, you have essentially an average rate of death that doesn't change throughout the life of an animal. Humans, on the other hand, well, we have very good survival ability for the majority of our life. So, you know, we're, we exhibit what's called a type 1, where we have very low death rates early in our lives and in the middle of our lives. And like many large animals, we live a long time, but then we get to a point where, of course, we get too old, and that's when the death rate starts to increase, which means our survival starts to decrease. So you get this sort of this sort of uh, um, sort of asymptotic curve where you're, you know, where it's flat at the top and then starts to bend down, and eventually, 100 years, we're done, um, or 100 percent of our lifespan. Not 100 years necessarily, if we're lucky, 100 years. <clears throat> now, on, on the opposite end of that, you have the type 3 curve. And in a type 3 curve, what you have is a very high rate of death among the young. But then after a certain point, you become older and established, and you have a very good survivability where you can last a long time. So in this example, it's oysters. Oysters produce eggs. Those eggs are released into the, into the water columns that then move around on ocean currents. They develop as plankton, basically, zooplankton. And eventually, you know, a lot of them get killed during that process, right? They get, they get consumed by plankton eaters, zooplankton, things like that. But eventually, a few of them will settle down onto the bottom into the right place, and they will, will grow into a shell. And once they grow and they develop their shell, they're pretty resistant to most predators, right? Another example could be sea turtles, right? We've all seen the footage of sea turtles pulling themselves onto a beach, laying their eggs, leaving, right? And those are the female sea turtles, and then the baby's hatching, and they have to make that mad dash across the beach into the water. Meanwhile, they're getting killed by predators left and right, whether it's birds, whether it's you know mammal predators, foxes, and things like that. Uh, and so a lot of them die. And you'll hear the, the narrator of the documentary saying something like, only one in a thousand... Uh, only one in a thousand sea turtles will make it to the to the ocean, you know, something like that, right? Uh, and that's exactly it, right? There's a high rate of death in the beginning. Once they're in the water, they're also susceptible to aquatic predators. But at a certain point, they become like a turtle, and they have they become large, and they have a large, uh, you know, very strong shell. And they're other than a few possible predators, not much else messes with them. So they move slow through the water, and they don't really have to worry about being exposed to predators like that, right? They've they've survived the hardest part, which is right up front. So that's the type three, type one, type two, type three. These are very good to know. So that's the survival part. So that accounts for the birth and death rate. But often, what we're interested in is how that population is going to change in the future. So in addition to a life table, often what we want to do is also produce a reproductive table. Now, in a reproductive table, for fairly obvious reasons, they tend to focus on the females in a population of animals. Um, and basically, it's the same thing as a life table in that it's broken down by age, by age group. And you're trying to summarize sort of reproductive activity. So here's the reproductive table for that same population of Belding's ground squirrels at Tioga Pass in California. So take a look at this and see if you could notice anything from the table. Okay, so there's a, quite a few things you could see from this table. First off, that first year, for ages 0 to 1, no one's producing any offspring. That makes sense because they're kind of offspring themselves, right? And then in the next year, you have, you know, about 65% of them weaning a litter, meaning that they've, they've given birth. And you see the litter size is about 3, 3.3. And... Uh, and you know, as you move up in age, that number, that proportion of females weaning a litter increases. And by the time you get to six years old, 100%, right, of your female population of these ground squirrels, whoever makes it that far, 
100% of those females are now breeding, right? So that tells you, okay, by six years, the whole female population is, is contributing to the reproduction of this population. You also notice that the litter size, the mean litter size, tends to start off pretty small. That's pretty common because they're still kind of small themselves, right? It's a big investment to invest in reproduction. But by the time you hit, you know, three to four, four to five years, uh, you've kind of reached your peak in population in your uh, litter size. So the number of offspring you're going to produce, right, um, per female, you kind of hit your, your plateau, if you will. And then after that, you see it starts to decline. So it slowly creeps up. And then about five years, you reach kind of your peak, your peak reproductive effort, and then it starts to decline. So even though you could still breed in your eighth year, your ninth year, you're producing less offspring on average compared to that peak, right? Um, you'll also notice that... Um, you know, they're focusing on females in a litter, right, in those last two columns, so the average number of female offspring, right? So as, for the most part, you see that kind of what you expect, where the average number of female offspring is basically half of whatever the number of females are. So basically 50% chance of males, 50% chance of female offspring, right? The reason you want to know about females is because that gives you an indication of, okay, if this many females are produced and this many of them survive, you know, what's the reproductive potential for years later, right? So the idea is you're trying to get the information you need to make accurate predictions about the future. So these are interesting um, information. And when you have this sort of information, you start to, to understand the, the animal or plant's life history traits. So these are three big life history traits. The age of first reproduction, how old are they? before they can start to breed, right? Uh, how, how often do they breed? How often do they undergo a reproductive cycle, right? Are they a, a type of species that breeds once a year, once every two years, or three or four times a year, right? This will obviously have a huge impact on how fast your population can recover from something, right? Like a disaster or something like that. Uh, and also an indication of how many offspring are produced, right? What is the litter size or clutch size? Usually we use litter size if they're live born, like in mammals, clutch size if they're if they're producing eggs, um, all of these things right here are very important factors, and they're going to determine the type of creature you're dealing with, right? These are factors that are going to shape how the organism develops, how um, physiology is going to operate, and the behavior of those organisms, right? So rhinos, for example, you often think about rhinos and conservation, obviously poaching for their horn, right? Uh, a lot of that's kind of kind of slowed down, which is good, giving these guys a chance to, to uh, bring their populations back a little bit. But they're still very susceptible to, to this type of hunting, illegal hunting. And a big reason is because of they're limited by how fast they can reproduce, right? I mean, this female has a baby, a very cute little baby rhinoceros, uh, but she's going to have that same baby rhinoceros for two to three years, which means she's not going to breed again for two to three years. So it'll take a while for a population to to recover when you're dealing with that, right? As opposed to, say, a creature that can produce tons of eggs uh, and survive. Uh, and even if a fraction of those survive, they'll still be a huge number, and they can potentially do this multiple times a year to the point where they can become a pest, right? Animals that breed often uh, are the ones that tend to become pests. Right. So we can often characterize these two different types of reproduction. So the first is what we call semiparous or Big Bang reproduction. This is the most extreme form. This is the, you know, we're talking about the two extremes here. So this is something like salmon. So these are sockeye salmon somewhere in probably Alaska or maybe British Columbia. And they're the characteristic story that you hear, right? They, they swim up the rivers. The same ones they were born at, they go to the same place, they reproduce once, and then they die. And they reproduce a ton of, they, they release a ton of eggs, those get fertilized, those animals, the parents then die, their nutrients become part of the nutrient cycle in these rivers, and those nutrients actually help to, to encourage the development of, of those offspring. Right, so those babies are now going to hatch, and they're going to make their way back out to the sea. And you hear about the perilous journeys that they take one way and the other. Right, so this sort of reproduction 
can be an advantage, actually, especially if you're in a place that's very unpredictable, a place with a lot of variability, where you may not have the optimal chances to, to breathe. So when the conditions are right, you go for it 100%, because tomorrow is not guaranteed. And because tomorrow is not guaranteed, you live for today, and you live to get your offspring out there in the world, right? And you and you'll even risk yourself to do it. On the other extreme, you have Idoroparis reproduction. So this is a century plant, which is a type of agave you find out in the desert. And they call it a century plant because not that it necessarily takes a century, but it takes a long time for these plants to bloom. Conditions have to be just right. So this is often uh, a useful thing where uh, the plant will reproduce, it'll release a ton of offspring, but it does so very, uh, not very often, but it'll do it repeatedly. So century plants live for a very long time. There are some out there that are a couple hundred years old. So every five or six years, they'll produce a ton of, of offspring, right? So this is a good strategy if you're in a place that you know is pretty dependable. We would probably fall more to the Idoroparis reproduction category, obviously. We live for quite a while. We can reproduce pretty much whenever we want, I guess. Um, we don't tend to for social reasons and for money. I don't, college, you all know, is not too cheap nowadays. Um, but it's an example of, of um, how we, the environment's going to shape how reproduction takes place. So here's a question. We live in a world where resources are finite, right? They're limited. Not everybody gets everything. So is it better for an organism to invest in their own survival under conditions when resources are very limited? Or should they invest in reproduction to ensure that their genes are passed on to future generations? So you might need some information to answer this, and I want you to think about that, but I'll give you two examples. Here's the dandelion example from before. We all know that dandelions can produce a ton of seeds, they can disperse everywhere, and they kind of fall somewhere random, right? And they do this every year. But there are species that doesn't live very long. Whereas on the other end here, this is a palm tree. This is a coconut palm, just like the coconuts you have on the coast here in Florida. These coconuts can fall into the water, and they can be adrift for years, land on some deserted island somewhere, and sprout and form a new coconut, which is why we have coconut forests on even the most remote tropical Pacific islands that are nowhere near land. Coconuts have somehow made it there. In some cases, even when animals haven't made it onto land there. Two very big, big extremes. One's investing in survival. One's investing in reproduction. Right? You could argue that dandelion is investing in reproduction because it's only going to live for that, that one season, that one year. Whereas, on the other hand, a coconut can produce offspring, release it, and survive for a very long time, many years. So what sort of information might you need to know to answer this question for a particular organism? Take a second. Well, I already gave you one of the answers, how long it lives, right? You might want to know how long an organism is going to live. If it's an organism that's only going to live for a year, then you want to go ahead and just get your reproduction out of the way. If you're an organism that's going to live forever, maybe you can bide your time, invest in your own survival and wait until the good times, right? It might also help to know how often they breed. You might help, help to know what are their likelihood that the, the, the reproduction will be successful. Right? You might want to know uh, how many offspring are produced. So there's a lot of things. And these are, these are the, the reason why we want to know this, this information from these various tables, reproductive tables, life history tables, that sort of thing. So let's talk about what happens once you know your population and you want to figure out the future. You want to make a model. How a population is going to change over time. Well, you can have an idealized situation. So this is a situation where you can experience exponential growth. And you're all probably pretty familiar with the idea of exponential growth. This is a situation where there's nothing limiting how your population is going to grow. Right? So you have every population has a growth rate. And the growth rate is often done per capita. And there's actually an, uh, a letter that goes along. We'll talk about that. But your population growth rate or your per capita increase 
as you would expect, it's basically your birth rate minus the death rate. So whatever that value is, is your growth rate. Now, if you have more births than deaths, you're going to be a positive number, meaning that you're going to grow. If you have more deaths than births, it means your population is going to start to decline, as we know, right? You know this stuff. So this is an example of African elephants undergoing exponential growth, um, starting from, from the 1900s to basically the late 70s. So why is, would this, some information like this be useful? And what is an assumption that is being made? So again, exponential growth. Well, let's answer the second question first. Why is the assumption being made? Well, the assumption being made is that there's nothing necessarily uh, going to happen to your, your creatures, right? No big calamity is going to happen. Idealized situation, there's no limit on external growth, meaning that there's no, um, no predators, right? In the case of elephant, there's no poachers, right? So the idea is you're seeing what they call the intrinsic uh, growth rate how much a population can grow potentially if we take everything else out of the equation what is the the possible limits of growth of a particular population or of a particular species so that's a big assumption and very rarely is that assumption even met so what's the value of using an approach like this well it kind of gives you a starting point Right? If you're talking with about a rare population of, of creatures, let's say, you want to bring them back from the brink of extinction, so to speak. Well, you want to know how, what's a realistic goal? What's possible? What is possible if you control every, if you maximize birth rates, minimize death rates, what is the possible growth that population can experience? Exponential growth. It's also very useful when uh, we're dealing with things that grow very quickly. Like, for example, that sickness that came by in 2020, right? If you guys remember that. Um, it seemed that like it was like a very fast thing, right? Start, I heard reports of it started in China, and then next thing you know, it's Italy and Florida, and it's all over the place, right? Um, so that was an example of this very rapid growth in cases of, of COVID. So... It, this sort of modeling approach, which is what this is, modeling, it's you're attempting to understand a population by, by playing out scenarios and simulations, can give us sort of an upper limit of what's possible. So how do we get this kind of stuff? Well, <clears throat> first of all, you can have a situation where the population doesn't grow. And simply as it's expected, it's called zero population growth. Birth rate equals death rate makes perfect sense. You don't need to know the calculus involved. It's quite complex. But using differential calculus, if you're... Calculus is basically just looking at how things change and how to how to do math when your numbers are constantly changing, right? Like a, like a rate is constantly changing. So differential calculus is used by taking your population growth rate and looking at it over time and how does that change over time. So your change in your population, that's what that delta symbol is, delta n, your population size, the change in population size over the change in time, delta t, right? And that gives you your r, which is your rate of increase. And this is a number that's, that's you know, it could be less than one, it could be more than one, multiplied by your population size, your population size at that time, right, at a particular time. So that's the basic, basic um, equation. And when you actually model it, you could come up with uh, what they call the intrinsic rate of increase, which is your ideal population. You've maximized your re rate of reproduction. And you produce this so-called J-shaped curve, which is what we talk about. So here, uh, when we do this, we'll often use R max, saying that this is the maximum reproduction we can have. And here's two populations. In one case, the population, the 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 change in population size over the change in time is one, meaning that it's maximized, and that gives us this red line. So within like six, seven generations, we've reached a maximum population size. If uh, if the intrinsic rate is half of that, let's say, so 0 0.5, then it takes a few more generations to reach the same point, right? So they're all still growing, just at different rates. Now again, this is a model, and it provides us with an ideal, 
And like all models, they're only ever accurate when you have all the factors accounted for that really impact your population in real life, right? And you probably know that exponential growth is not a sustainable thing. There's always going to be something limiting your population, right? Some resource. Resources are not unlimited, right? Predators are out there. Calamities happen, right? These are things that are going to affect the population and how it grows. So a more realistic way to do this is to, to establish a, a different model. So using logistic growth, which makes a little more sense. So here's some data on paramecium, and they're growing in the lab, but they've got to deal with all the normal things that they would need to deal with, right? So in this case, instead of that simple J-shaped curve that goes nothing but straight up, it starts to plateau because you reach a point where that population is going to have to start making some tough decisions, right? So we reach the carrying capacity, or what we call K, right? And logistic growth works by taking that exponential growth model and introducing this idea of a K, the carrying capacity. So what's the carrying capacity? What does this mean? Well, at its simplest, carrying capacity means how many of an individual, how many how many uh, individuals in a population can be supported by the environment, whether that is because of the resources that are present, whether that is because of the nature of how many predators or parasites or diseases are out there. Whatever the environment has in terms of things that can limit the population, taking that into account. That's what the carrying capacity is, right? How many is the maximum that a popula that an environment can support in terms of a population? So it's real simple, actually. Here's the equation. It's basically the same as the previous equation, except that you introduce this other thing um, with k minus n over k. What that does is it introduces this idea that the closer you are to your carrying capacity, your rate of increase, or your R, is going to change, right? So if you're far from your carrying capacity, your R can be really, really high because you're undergoing this exponential growth still. But as you approach carrying capacity, your R is going to start to slow down. It's going to start to get smaller, right? So in other words, as K becomes closer to N, the closer you are to, to that being... Um, to that being zero, right? So the closer you are to, to, to K, as your population starts to approach its carrying capacity, that rate of increase is going to slow down. Right? So that's what the logistic models do. They simply introduce that extra element to it. So how does this look graphically? Well, here it is. So here's the number of generations. You see in blue, that's exponential growth. Exponential growth model shows the population size hitting 1,500 uh, within, what, six, seven, seven generations maybe? It hits that 1,500 mark. So you see the exponential growth. It ends with the rate of increase being uh, 1.0, right? Now let's just say we introduce that 1,500 is the carrying capacity. So now same rate of increase, but now we've introduced the, the carrying capacity of 1,500. Now all of a sudden you're seeing that the closer you get, it starts off kind of the same, but after you get to generation five or six, they start to diverge, right? The R starts to decrease. That red line starts to take a, a little more generations to reach the same level, right? And then by the 10th generation, 11th generation, you're close to carrying capacity. That rate of increase is almost zero. You see? So that's what it looks like. Same parameters, just one has a new uh, carrying capacity. Okay, so here again is that paramecium showing the, the numbers in paramecium around carrying capacity. And here's Daphnia. Daphnia is also grown in a lab here. Number of Daphnia per 50 milliliters. Notice that the populations, the actual data, which are the dots, they surpass that carrying capacity, but then then recover. What's going on there? Well, real simple. 
Daphnia grew, they grew and grew and grew, and they had their resources, but at some point they ran out of resources. They overshot. And all of a sudden you had a whole bunch of starving uh, Daphnia that then had to die off. And that's what happens. They, they died off, and then you reach levels that are more consistent with the carrying capacity, and then it's going to fluctuate around that carrying capacity for a while. Right? So you see, you take a model, you have a model, and then you plot real data to it to see how good your model is. And that's how models work. Right? They're there to represent um, you know, how things can possibly work. Right? So it's sometimes very hard to figure out K because populations fluctuate a lot. And there's a thing that happens, and it's especially important in conservation, uh, which is very unfortunate. It's kind of like a, a positive feedback almost. It makes things worse when they're already pretty bad. And that's the Ali effect. So the Ali effect is this situation that happens when you have a population size that is small, right? And it's so small to the point where you know, survival starts to be affected and reproduction starts to be affected, meaning that you reach a point where you get, are just too small to recover. And you can see why this is important for conservation. So this is an example of an animal that's undergoing this. This is an adox. Adox are found in, in the Sahara, in the Middle East, or at least they were. And now they're essentially, it's thought that they're extinct in the wild. There might be small populations in the remotest parts of the Sahara in in like uh, Niger and Chad, but these are war zones, so no one's really studying them out there, right? But there are some populations in captivity, but when you have a population that's so small, well, think about it. If it's a wild population, if, if there's so few individuals, they might have a hard time finding each other, right? Females and males may not find each other, right? Uh, so reproduction doesn't happen. When reproduction does happen, it could be the environment is just so far gone that they can't persist, right? So every individual that dies is a big segment of a population, of a population increase, right? Um, the conditions that made them rare in the first place are probably still going on, right? So it becomes a real problem, and it's something that people want to avoid. You also start seeing a genetic impact, right? We talked about genetic drift. Well, when you're a small population, the likelihood that your genetics are going to be disadvantageous, or you might have some rare alleles or something, the likelihood that they can be a, a problem increases because that might be, you know, overrepresented in your population, right? Rare alleles that weren't that were problems before didn't matter because you had a lot of individuals, but in a small population, based on genetic drift, you know, you have a small little bottleneck effect. The few individuals that are there might have some deleterious genetic thing that doesn't seem to go away, like a disease or something. So it could become a real problem. So when we talk about species, we like to talk about um, K-selected species versus R-selected species. R-selected species are those that maximize that rate of increase. So that R, R-selection is that R, that rate of increase from the equations. It's saying that, okay, they're going to maximize reproduction. So they're often animals that can recover very quickly from disturbance, and they can get out of hand, right? Sometimes we call these density independent because they're not affected by how many individuals are out there, as opposed to K-selected species that are density dependent. K is the carrying capacity from the equation. So how how rapidly they grow depends on how many of them there are and hence are dependent on that population density so they're very sensitive to that so what are some examples well our selected species i often think about florida because florida has a lot of invasive species including things like this cane toad right here uh, invasive species get to an area and the really invasive species are the ones that can reproduce a lot you don't have to go too far. Step outside of this building here, in the Bush Building, all over Rollins campus, you're going to see those little lizards, those are brown anoles. They produce tons of offspring, and they produce multiple uh, clutches per year, and as a result, they've taken over. They're not from here. They're from you know, Cuba and Bahamas, um, and they've become established in the South uh, U.S., right, in the Southeastern U.S., and uh, it's because of their ability to maximize that rate of increase. Case-selected species, on the other hand, 
Uh, they tend to be animals that live longer, tend to be larger, don't reproduce as much, right? So big differences, right? One's more likely to be a pest, the other is more likely to be an endangered species. So what sort of factors stop a population from growing indefinitely? Usually we think of resources as being the main one, right? Every population has an upper limit, right? But some populations can show real big changes over time. Others remain very stable. This is an example of cicadas, right? Cicadas are underground for so long, and every few years in certain areas, they'll come out en masse and reproduce, right? Example of a semilparous type of strategy, reproduce and then die. So those type of situations, you don't see any cicadas for a while of this particular species, and then all of a sudden there's tons of them. Same can be said about locusts, right? So why do some populations do this and others don't? Well, it depends on the environment. If you live in an environment where you need certain conditions to, to persist and survive and succeed, then that's what's going to happen, right? You're going to wait for those perfect conditions to arise. But if you live in an environment where it's pretty constant through time, then maybe you don't need those conditions. So when we talk about populations um, and density dependent, then we talk about them being self-regulated, meaning that birth and death rates are susceptible to what we call negative feedbacks that are going to regulate population growth. So the more individuals you have in a population, and if resources are limited, well, then there's going to be more competition for those resources within a species as well as possibly between species, right? Which means that you might have more uh, territoriality, right? Animals being kicked out of, an, of a place and told to go somewhere else because there's not enough resources. Or they might fight over those resources and kill each other. You could also get a disease, right? Many diseases that are communicable diseases, they spread faster and more intensely in high population densities compared to low population densities. So if you're a, an animal that's very susceptible to diseases, particular ones, then reaching a certain point, that disease becomes a factor that then drives down your population. Predation, right? Animals will often feed on the most common thing in their environment, right? Predators. So if there's a lot of deer, that'll become the main prey of things that can hunt the deer, right? There's also other things that you don't see, which is kind of where I come in. I, I study stress, for example. Stress is interesting. There could be this, this stress from having this many animals in the environment, having to compete all the time. And even if they don't kill each other, as you know, stress can, can have very big effects on behavior. It could have very big effects on reproduction. It can actually shut down libido and, and territoriality and things like this. So having stress could actually shut down reproduction. So another way to come to regulate a population is not just by killing off individuals, but also by limiting how, how many offspring are produced. All of these will do the same thing. They'll correct that population towards that carrying capacity. So these are Pierre David's deer, by the way, which is a rare species of deer from China that has been brought back in many places uh, through captive breeding and stuff like that. And now to the point where there's actually quite a few of them in some semi-wild places around the world. Now here's a graph. This is a dif different type of animal. This is an ibex. Uh, and this is looking at the percentage of juveniles that produce lambs. So the percentage of juveniles that are reproducing. Uh, and ibex are these animals that live in small herds. They're mountain animals. They're actually the ancestor of the, of the goat, of our domestic goat. Pretty cool looking. Uh, and I have a certain fascination with them because they take me to wild places whenever I look for them. These are Wallia ibex I saw in Ethiopia. So the males right there, you'll often see them banging heads together. So depending on the population size, you're seeing that uh, the percentage of juveniles producing lambs changes. So what's going on? Well, this is a tricky one. So this is an example of behavior, right? Uh, if you have a very large population, that means that there's a lot of adults. So a lot of adults, they tend to be a territorial animal. They tend to exhibit a polygamous kind of mating system where they basically have a harem. Uh, one male will control a large number of females. I'm, you know, not control, but monopolize access to, to a large number of females. And they'll do this, and 
they'll exclude other males, right? And they'll have their little epic combats where they hit each other with their horns, right? So that happens at large population sizes because there's a lot of adults. But if you reach a low population size where there aren't a lot of males present, then juveniles, juvenile males, will have a higher likelihood of, of siring um, females or siring uh, offspring. And by siring offspring, that means that they're gaining access to mating opportunities because there's fewer adult males to exclude them. Adult males are scary. They got those big giant horns. Uh, juveniles don't have horns that are that large. So this kind of gets to sort of territoriality. So territoriality, the effect it has on populations, whether it's these gannets that are breeding at this, uh, you know, this island off the coast of Quebec, or whether it's you know, a large animal like this cheetah marking its territory, they have the ultimate effect of decreasing population sizes in an area because they force animals to, to be dispersed a certain way, right? to be distributed a certain way. So if you have territorial animals, your populations will tend to get lower, right? But territoriality is often necessary uh, because territoriality shows up when you have the opportunity to control a resource and gain access to it. It has to be a resource that can be controlled, right? And by having a access, controlling the access to the resource, it gives that individual reason to be territorial, it gives them a net benefit. If it's a resource that can't be controlled, then territoriality doesn't usually occur. So you think of territoriality like having a large area of forest, you can do your hunting in, you can control that large area of forest up to a certain point, right? But if it's something that can't be controlled, um, you know, maybe because too many individuals want it, so you don't want to be fighting all the time, Right? You have other things to do other than control your territory and engage in battle all the time. That's a very bad way to go. right? Um, or it could be that the resource is just so widespread that it can't be really controlled. It has to be found in one spot. So I think, for example, of seals. right? Male seals are very territorial on the beaches because there's only a few beaches out there where they can, you know, females can pull out and, and have their, their offspring on the beach. So a male can potentially control a section of beach. Right, so it engages in territoriality there, but in the water, it's not able to control access to females. It's also not able to control access to to fish. You know, it can't do that, so it doesn't engage in territoriality there. It does so on the beach. So here's another factor: diseases. So diseases are very, very interesting. So how do populations influence disease? Well, we already talked about population density, right? High population densities increases the chances of disease, right? Um, and if you have a place where there's a very high concentration of animals, that's often where disease happens. So in this top picture here, you're seeing gray bats with little white around their snouts. That's not, that makes them look cute, but that's actually a fungus, right? That's white nose syndrome, which has really decimated bat populations in North America. The reason it's able to do this is because they live in these hibernacula and they basically hibernate in caves close together for warmth and that fungus can spread from one individual to another and it's caused really, it's wrecked a lot of havoc in a lot of bat populations, right? Um, so their high density is a problem, right? So how is disease like a predator? Well, it can kill you, obviously, so it can act like a predator in that regards, right? It can really decimate a population. So you also know from documentaries maybe that predators always go for the young and the sick, which is kind of how diseases work too, right? Young are often most susceptible to most diseases uh, and also being older often or being sick in the first place is often make you more susceptible to disease. So in those regards, it acts like a predator, right? Um, but in some cases, it, it acts even more virulent than a predator, right? Unlike a predator, Disease can wipe out healthy individuals too, and it can have a very drastic effect very quickly, unlike predators where the effect is kind of just a constant over time. So these are dead saiga antelope. Saiga antelope are very uh, cool antelope that live in the, the steppes of Eurasia. They used to reach these huge numbers. They're, uh, they're best known for the males having these very bulbous noses that they use in, cor in courtship. So they're a type of antelope that runs around. They're actually one of the fastest animals out there. Um, 
A few years ago, there was a massive die-off of these animals due to a respiratory virus that they were getting. This was all before COVID too. Uh, and it, it made them go from being a, I want to say a, a common animal, but being a fairly widespread animal that wasn't even on the endangered species list to all of a sudden becoming this critically endangered animal in the span of like a couple of years, which is insane. So, you know, you know, like a few hundred thousand of them died. Um, and it was kind of widespread. So here, this is a mass grave of these things because they wanted to control the spread of infection. This is a mass grave of Saiga antelope in Kazakhstan, one of the places where you have the, the steppes, the open prairies of, the, of Eurasia. Predators don't do this, right? You don't all of a sudden have this massive die-off from predators. Okay, so uh, predation. Well, predation, of course, has an effect on populations. Um, if, if the prey population is building up, predators might switch to feeding on that particular type of animal, right? When that animal becomes rare, predators will often prey switch to some other species, right? So it can vary. <coughs> Um, some other sort of factors that are interesting, toxic wastes. So you can get this interesting situation where if waste builds up, right, accumulation of, of, of waste in a population could impact that population in sort of a density dependent way. The more, the more, um, the, uh, you know, the higher the the population density in a given area where there's toxic waste, the bigger effect it will have on population size. So it kind of depends on how many animals can be exposed to this stuff. And it could also lead to sort of some unspoken physiological things that can control population size. Both of these can work, I already mentioned stress, but both of these can work by regulating re reproduction as well as survival. So it could impact survival and make it harder for an animal to survive with exposure, or it could make, uh, make it harder for them to reproduce healthy offspring that can survive. Right. So all these things can work together to regulate a population. So populations undergo these regular cycles. And we know this from just common sense. Populations go up, populations go down at any given moment. But sometimes there's these very regular patterns, and we call these the boom and bust cycles, right? Just like in econo economics, right? Same thing. You, know, you got boom times, you got bust times. So this is some data showing, this is famous data showing the 10-year boom and bust cycle of rabbits. So on the uh, y-axis, so on the x-axis you have time. Uh, the time, by the way, is obtained by looking at fur, fur bearers, um, you know, are trapped in North America and they'll sell the furs back in the day. And this actually gave a good record of which animals were more common in the environment than other than other times so you can actually follow it and they follow this really distinctive 10-year cycle in these two species so the number of rabbits snowshoe hares so these are the the rabbits that turn white in the winter to match their surroundings right up north so the number of hares on the one y-axis and this is one of those graphs that have two y-axes in the red you have the number of lynx which are in the thousands right both are in the thousands, but notice that there's a difference in the numbers, right? Obviously, lynx are really cool cats, uh, and they are predators of snowshoe hares, right? And what you see is, uh, you know, they kind of follow this fairly regular pattern with the exception of one thing, right? Their, their boom and bust cycles are pretty similar, 10 years apart, but there's a small little difference. How, what's the difference? Anybody notice? Well, if you look at the actual graph, uh, what you'll see is that although they both have this 10-year cycle, there's a slight lag with the lynx compared to the snowshoe hare. Snowshoe hare starts its, its boom times a little bit earlier than the, the hare. And there were three predictions or three hypotheses that were, that were proposed to explain this. So here are the, the three hypotheses. The first is it has to do with the food supply for the hare, right? So there might be a cycle of food supply. So they went ahead and did the experiments. So they wanted to test this hypothesis to see whether or not there's a, there's a food supply thing that's accounting for these changes in populations. And you know, if that, they did an experiment, so they added additional food to, to a site. So they found this site where they had hares, uh, or you know, snowshoe hares, snowshoe rabbits, 
and they added additional food for them to eat. So what would you predict for this hypothesis? If it was to be correct, what do you expect would happen to this population if they were suddenly given food? And they were just given constant supply of supplemental food. Well, if food is, the, is the, the factor, then giving them food and making a stable source of food should get rid of that pattern, right? And if it gets rid of that pattern, you should also see it get rid of that pattern with the, the lynx as well, right? So the lynx are obviously eating their food supply. They're eating the hares. When there's a lot of hares, there's a lot of lynx. When there's low amounts of lynx, there's low amounts of hares, right? So if you were to give snowshoe hares food, their population should stabilize. They wouldn't have to go through this boom-bust cycle. And you should see that echoed in the hair population, or in the uh, lynx population. So the second hypothesis is that it might be driven by predators from other, other types of animals, not necessarily lynx, because lynx are kind of rare. So they propose an experiment where they would simply exclude predators from gaining access to population of snowshoe rabbits. And if that was the case, if they were able to, to exclude them with, say, like an electrified fence, and you could also put wires at the top to keep things like hawks and stuff out, what would you expect to happen with that population? Well, again, if if that's the driving for factor, then you would expect a population to stabilize again once you remove predators. Okay, uh, and the third one was actually an interesting one. They thought that maybe it had to do with the cycles of sunspot activity. Sunspots are places where they where there's a very intense heating in particular areas of the sun. I know what you're thinking, like the sun's already pretty damn hot. Um, but in having these sort of the things, we often get are these sort of black areas that actually will decrease the light reaching um, reaching the earth. Right? I know there's a lot of things I said that doesn't make sense. It's overheated, so therefore it's decreasing light available. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so what that means is you'll have less light at particular times of year and there are there are sunspot cycles for sure so if that's the the um, possible explanation so the idea being that there's less light lights needed for photosynthesis you should know that by now and uh, less light means decrease in uh, vegetation during that time so if that's the case what might sort of uh, would you predict uh, for that hypothesis to be correct about sunspots um, impacting hair populations. Well, you would expect there to be a relationship between those, right? So more sunspots, less hairs, right? And there would be a lag. Now, here's the fun part. Which one of these three is correct? Well, we don't know 100% yet, but it looks like all three of them are contributing. So that's interesting, right? They've done these big studies, and yet they still don't have the answers to these. Okay, so we talked about populations. Uh, I just want to kind of mention this, this new way of thinking about populations. We tend to think of populations as here is this area, here is this park. Let's protect this park because there's a rare animal or some rare plants in there, right? And that's great. I'm all for making parks. But you create this essentially island in amidst human activity that is often the root cause of the declines in these populations in the first place. And in doing so, you've cut them off. You've cut off immigration, immigration. We haven't talked too much about that yet. But it's, it's starting to become an increasingly important factor, especially when you think about um, populations, you think about genetics and stuff like that. You kind of want that gene flow, right? You want animals going in and out, uh, plants being able to disperse in and out of, uh, of a park or a protected area. And to protect it in the first place, you might need an enormous amount of space that you might not have available. So you might be protecting these tiny fragments. And we'll get more into that whole idea. So now we've sort of changed our thinking into thinking about meta-populations, right? So we think about how things are connected. So this is Florida. This is the, you know, we have the, the Florida panther, which is really just the the remnant population of the eastern cougar that used to roam all over the eastern coast of, of the United States, well into Canada. Now, of course, there's mountain lions, which are the western cougar. Those are, those are fine. If anything, they're increasing. 
But in Florida, this is the last population of, of Florida panthers. And even then, they had to be supplemented with other animals over time. But uh, we want to increase their numbers. And they're confined to a small area of the Everglades and, and uh, Big Cypress National Parks down there in the southwestern corner of the United, of the United, of the uh, Florida Peninsula. Uh, but we want to expand. We want to allow animals to move up and down. So we've created these corridors. And Florida's been really good about this. They, they have a lot of protected lands, in part because a lot of it is wet swamp land we can't really use very easily. But nonetheless, we have these very large expanses of protected area. So the Florida Wildlife Co Corridor project has aimed to connect these various um, places in order to encourage animals to move freely, right? Uh, so the idea is to create a more stable population by allowing that movement, right? So they're not limited in one spot where they're gonna start feeling the effects of a small isolated population. So populations matter. And I mentioned that we're going to talk about geopolitics, so i got to throw out some geopolitics out there. But obviously it matters. The relationship between uh, China and the United States, for example, it's a really varied one, right? China has become this major economic power in part because of the United States outsourcing a lot of its manufacturing and, and opening up China to trade. So even though it's a communist country, they still do all the capitalist things. They have companies, they, they make things, they sell things, they have a domestic market and all this stuff, right? Often the decisions that are made are based on geopolitics. So right now we're seeing a phase where China is becoming this sort of aggressive country that's exerting its influence a little more than it used to. Well, in part because of demographics and population. It's predicted that China's population is going to, to decrease substantially during the next few decades as a result of a number of things, including the one-child policy they had for a very long time in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And they only recently got rid of it, right? They raised it up to two children because they realized we can't do this. They were concerned about running out of resources. And now they're concerned about, well, we have resources, but our population is going to decline, right? And that's our workforce. So it's becoming a thing. And we're starting to concern about these, right? We're starting to see declines in birth rate. We're starting to see changes in death rate in different places, right? And these are going to influence your population size. And your population size is important for us as a species because our industries depend on that, right? People retire when they're older. Young people work. Young people learn, right? Older people can retire because often they're dependent on the money coming in from middle-aged people. So we worry about age structure. So here are three countries, right? This is the demographics for three different countries looking at the percentage of the population that falls into the various age categories for males and females. Notice, very different, right? So one of these countries is a war-torn country that will perpetually be at war, it seems. Uh, another is a very stable economy, and the other is a company, uh, an economy that's becoming very unstable with a lot of concerns about the future. So here are three different graphs. Three different uh, graphs showing age structure. Which of these do you think is the war-torn country? Well, it'd be that first one. That first one that has this nice pyramid. A large number of uh, people are in that, you know, less than 20 or so, right? If you're going to stage a revolution, if you're going to have war and conflict, that's the population structure you're looking at. A lot of young and if you've had lots of war, very few people reach those older ages, right? And often places that have a lot of war are places that will have, um, you know, fewer elderly. That pyramid-shaped one in the, in the, on the left side, uh, that's Afghanistan, right? So it's a place that's seen nothing but war for the last few decades, unfortunately. Well, the one in the middle, well, that's the United States, a fairly straightforward population. You'll see that you have this, this big kind of a big bulge that those are your baby boomers right that are now in their 50s and 60s actually this is kind of old data so they've moved up a couple of notches up the way um, but you still have a fairly consistent population structure right and obviously by the time you get to 85 you know nature's going to take its course right but you see that you have pretty good stability on the other end on the, the far right here you have this sort of inverted pyramid where you have this large bulge but you have very few young people. This is Japan. Japan's you know, one of those sort of preeminent aging populations. 
Well, those people are now moving through and they're going to get older and older and older and they're going to want to retire. And when they retire, well, part of that retirement is going to be paid for by younger generations. It's already becoming an issue, right? And that's why you see Japan, for example, investing heavily into robotics and automation because they're not going to have the workforce to supply um, a lot of the, the basic jobs, right? Um, one way they can get around it is by increasing immigration, which they never would have done before, but now they're starting to consider it, which is interesting, right? A lot of people would love to move to Japan, but they don't make it easy. So um, you also have a lot of differences, right, in terms of the type of country you are. If you're a developed country that's industrialized, right, meaning that you have industries and you're able to export those industries outside of your country, your orange bar, well, you have very low infant mortality and a higher life expectancy. If you're a developing country, one that either hasn't industrialized yet or is in the process of industrialized, so often, uh, you know, we tend to think of it as like, quote unquote, third world, that world doesn't really apply anymore, but third world developing country, a country that relies a lot on agriculture, subsistence agriculture, the economy is mostly really inward looking, they're not exporting anything except possibly a resource, which often comes with its own problems, right? Oil or coltan or something, right? Um, you see differences in infant mortality, life expectancy, right? So the human condition is quite varied, right? So we're always wondering things like how many people can be supported by our planet, right? How much can the biosphere support? There's a lot of people out there. And, you know, we live in interesting times because for a long time we thought it's going to be 11 billion. We're going to hit 11 billion. But now we're starting to see all these countries are starting to decline, in terms of their their population rate right so the future will tell for us it has implications because our impacts on the environment are so huge it's hard to say uh, we talk about ecological footprints right this is your the amount of carbon you produce per year right uh, and you see the more industrialized places the places where there's a better standard of living are often the places that produce the most carbon right uh, there's some places on there that look particularly dark. It's because they're, you know, either the type of fuel they're using, whether it's coal or whatever, uh, or they're just resource extracting, and that, that accounts for a lot of the carbon. But what you're seeing is the more industrialized places, your Europe, your, your Americas, you know, your East Asia. These are the places where you're seeing the biggest ecological footprint, but you're also seeing the biggest demographic changes. So time will tell. Ten years ago, I would have probably said, oh, 11 billion will be the maximum we would reach before we start mellowing out. Nowadays, I'm not so sure. Maybe things are starting to kick in a little bit earlier. Maybe climate change is a part of this process, right, of keeping humans in check. We don't think of it that way. But this could be our density-dependent factor, climate change, keeping us in check, keeping our populations low, right? Nature's maybe had it with us. Who knows, right? But we'll see in the future. Until then, have a good time. Study biology. I'll see you on the next one.